Thank you very much, Lucy. When the Penny Post... Uh, sorry. <laughs> Courtney, Courtney. When the Penny Post started in the 1840s, it did two things. It made communication so much easier for people. For the first time, you didn't have to pay when you received a letter. The person who sent the letter had to pay. Networks quickly spread right across Europe and then right across the world. It did two things. It liberated people, it particularly liberated women. It was the first time that they could exchange information at a distance without a chaperone being there. And there was a great fear campaign in the 1840s and the 1850s of what this would mean to family life uh, by women being able to write to people at a distance. The second thing that happened very quickly after the Penny Post, and I think the first government that set it up was in Russia, there was a black office in the post office building in St Petersburg and in <coughs> Moscow. Every letter was copied, opened and copied and then sent on its way. There was a similar black office in Berlin and in Vienna. They're the three that I know about. So data's never been completely secure. What we commit to in writing, and of course the, I was going to say to paper, but of course it's in writing, is there. The number of biographies that have been written over the last two centuries that have been largely um, resourced by all those letters that on the last sentence on the letter is, please burn this letter. And of course that never happened either. It's been a fascinating session and indeed it's been a fascinating day. Before I open up to questions from the floor, I'd just like to say what one of the key questions that have, that's come to my mind in the course of today is how is digital citizenship going to change the notion, not just of citizenship, but of government? We're citizens of governed states. And the three countries who are represented here today, Australia, New Zealand and Singapore, are all parliamentary democracies, representative democracies, and our whole structure of government and the way that citizens relate to the state and the state that relates to citizens is based upon parliamentary representative democracy. Digital citizenship, of course, gives the possibility for direct citizenship, and I hesitate to call it direct democracy because I think that's going to be one of the great traps of the future that we need to be aware of. We see it now through what can often be the rancid channels of Twitter and Facebook where some very noisy minorities try and drive the public agenda. For all its faults, parliamentary representative democracy, every vote has an equal weight. Not yet in the digital world does every voice have an equal weight. And I think that's something we need to think about very, very carefully indeed. Now, any questions for any of our three speakers? Or any comments for any of our three speakers? Or has the day gone on for far too long? <laughs> yes, gentleman at the back in the blue sh shirt. Um, Jay Robinson from Wellington City Libraries. Uh, what is our radioactive hot suit, Courtney, so we keep each other safe? <laughs> to wade through all of that toxic yeah, data. Um, gosh, uh, yeah, um, I was quite proud of myself because I actually wrote this on Tuesday, which is like a whole 36 hours like earlier than normal. So I don't have any of the solutions. I think I was just putting across some of the problems. Um, Marche said in his presentation, um, he was kind of encouraging far more uh, parsimonious and fleeting collection of data. So if you don't need to collect it, don't. If you don't need to hang on to it, don't. If you don't need to store it, don't. So kind of more of a catch and release policy. We've all got servers full of stuff that we think <coughs> might be useful one day, maybe. 
chuck it back there. Um, you know, when, when I put on my, my dark hat and I think about um, public funding slip sliding away from us and I think about our rich stores of data about people's interests and behaviour and I think about the people who might want to buy that data one day, I'd rather not have the data to sell. You know? Um, <laughs> such an anarchist. Um, so, no, I don't, I don't know what the hot suit was. Uh, what Cory Doctor I was saying, though, was that we need to invest in them, um, <clears throat> that people who handle our data need to um, be the opposite of Homer Simpson, kind of creating the nuclear accident inside the nuclear factory. Um, so, no, I, I, don't, I don't have the answer, but I do think we need to think about it if we're going to go into... Uh, data is so tempting. It's so seductive, that idea of what we can learn and what we can do with it. Um, maybe we don't go all the way through. Or maybe we think about security, but we don't think about longevity. Um, it, when I was working in libraries in Iowa and Wisconsin, uh, in the time of the Patriot Act being passed, that was very much an approach that we used in our library associations there was to talk about don't collect the data because um, the government can just walk in without a search warrant. And, and in fact, you get $10,000 fine or four years in jail if you were refusing uh, handing over your data of your customers, which mm -hmm. is supposed to be private, to the government just because they say they want it without even a warrant. So it's a strategy that's been around for a dozen years, but <laughs> Um, I guess, yeah, well, it makes I mean, sense. It's been around for longer, right? Please, well, yeah, please yeah. burn this letter. Like, yeah. yeah, except that the letter data. exists in one tiny space and something that's on the web can, or put out on the web can be all over the world in seconds. Any other questions? Yes. And, and, and then Anita. Kind of let some those Helga Arlington yeah. um, from uh, Albert Eden Local Board. I'm wondering whether there has, in fact, been successful use. This could, this could be answered by any of you. Um, the potential is to use demographic data, it was mentioned, to bring in a diverse audience. It doesn't. It brings in the same audience. Has anyone been successful in getting access to that diverse audience? And how did they do it? Okay, so um, your question just tried to reflect is use the um, data, diverse data, to attract a diverse audience. Um, what we have in the office, we do have uh, our database, <laughs> I guess it's about 4,000 ethnic community organizations data. And um, what we're trying to do is not to um, use the data to attract attention, but we think about and do some analysis first about what a component of different ethnicities and locations for those um, stakeholders and what information relevant to them. Because there's no point you push out and call things. So we only um, use our um, strategies to think about what um, audience are needed and what's relevant to them. And then we're just um, utilizing a, um, you know, our website and social media to call for engagement. That's our um, strategy. Sometimes we suggest um, some agencies to utilizing um, there's like ethnic media as well to um, go to certain language areas if that uh, information uh, is specifically to certain groups such as like Syrian refugees uh, gonna come to New Zealand, etc. So that's just from small input from my perspective. Uh, this is a response which has nothing to do with um, data collection and analysis, but more, uh, the, what I took from your question is what has worked in terms of attracting um, particular audiences. In my experience, in respect of Māori, what has worked has been face-to-face. -face. So the whole notion of having field workers, outreach workers. For example, uh, the Turnbull Library, we run digital storytelling um, workshops uh, aimed at Māori and aimed at a youth demographic. Because first of all, we want to promote the fact that there's an enormous amount of Māori-specific material out there, pictorial material in particular, that we want those people to know about. But the interesting thing is, although it's digital, um, what's getting the most engagement is having somebody rock up in an actual venue somewhere on a face-to-face, -face, taking those young kids through it. Mm. And that has worked for us. Uh, I, I don't think it's either or, but it, the point is, I think there's still got to be a place for face-to-face. 
Uh, well, you know, I don't have the data to... <laughs> <laughs> but what the expectation is, for, for example, with digital storytelling, is that once the barrier is down in terms of kids thinking, um, well, knowing where to find the stuff, that they'll go on and look for other stuff as well. So that, for us, that's what the um, measure of success would be, but don't have the data to back it up. Um, yeah, and I think, um, I mean, cultural institutions are kind of like the worried well, you know? Like, we, we beat ourselves over the back for the terrible, terrible job that we do when we're actually, most of us, doing a really good job and thinking about these things really hard and acting upon them. So on different levels, the face-to-face the -face is true. We, you know, at the Dallas, we, we on occasion literally go out and pick people up and drive them to the museum so that they can visit for the first time. Like, yeah, which is real basic. But you know what the bigger picture of that is? It's a really well-functioning, cheap public transport system so that people who can't travel easily between their home and all the places that should be available can do so. So, you know, when you're, when you're working at the level of driving your own car, and picking people up and dropping them off, but also lobbying for a better bus system or light rail or whatever it is. Kind of, we need to be operating at both ends if we really, really want to achieve these things. And if I can just add to that and, and support what Courtney's just said, what we've been doing at the State Library of South Australia, because there's great segments of the audience, of the potential audience that we're not getting coming into our building. Um, we got money from our foundation for a bus service and we work with the education department and for those very underprivileged schools in greater metropolitan Adelaide and right across the state, we bus them in. We give them a whole day in Adelaide. We work with the university as well to show them that the university is a place that welcomes them as well as the cultural institutions. Um, if they don't come to you, we have to come to them. And that does work, and what we have found, and we do have the data on this, um, the kids bring their parents and the rest of their family back in to have a look. And so it is, it is possible for those people that have never interacted with your organisation before to give them that taste, and they tell their friends and they tell their families, provided it's actually a very nice experience for them when they come. And that's not always the case, because so, sometimes we get that wrong too. Now, Anita, you've got a question. Thanks, Alan. I just wanted to test a counter-argument on the data question. <laughs> Tying back to the discussion around e-government this morning and the comment that um, people, that government needs to give people the services that they want and the, the discussion around um, getting the, the, the school qualification certified, which certainly rang true with me. I wonder whether um, in the, the digital age where there is so much information and there's so much requirement for us to engage with it, that there may be, you know, we may be willing to, to give up some of that protection of data in order to have the services that we want. And, that what, and I wonder whether there's a way that we can create a system where people can choose. Because, you know, certainly I think not just with government but with private, um, the private sector as well, with cultural institutions, I'm willing to admit that I'm actually quite happy to have ads that I see on my Facebook feed a little bit targeted towards things I'm interested in rather than just the whole lot being complete garbage that I, that I don't want to see. Perhaps that's, that's completely foolish of me, but bro broadly speaking, I think we don't necessarily have time to trawl through everything that we now have access to. And the only way to, to, to moderate that might be to let people use our data. So I'd be interested in your reaction. Um, I think maybe that, because that, I, I agree. I mean, I give my shit away all the time so that I can get stuff, and I'm really careless about that, but I have an email address that I use for that stuff often, and I won't do anything that wants my birth date. Um, and I do, don't use Facebook. Um, and I guess the thing is, like what Andrew was talking about with e-literacy, you know that Facebook is using you. But do most Facebook users know that? Do they know that an algorithm is presenting them with information or that marketing is targeting them or that they're not, they're not seeing the whole world that they think that they're seeing. They're seeing a slice of the world that's being predetermined for them 
based on their behaviour. Um, I, you know, I, I, this is not an area actually where I have a very particularly strongly formed opinion. I'm more, more kind of reflecting things that I've seen and been thinking about, but um, we have the advantage of being extremely literate people tackling these problems. And um, like after I've been here tonight, I'm going to go to the Wellington Museum um, opening and then I'm going to go to my Brazilian Jiu Jitsu club and I'm going to hang out with a whole bunch of young men, mostly who work in various kind of, um, they're sparkies or locksmiths or students or things like that. They almost all voted national. Um, and they, um, they keep me real because I, I see them, they will quote me um, news articles that they've seen on The Onion because they don't understand satire. Um, and I don't say that as a criticism, I say that as the fact that we don't always... It's so easy to lose touch. Yeah. So just as a follow-up, I guess, that uh, talking about creating this system which can allow people to understand that and choose, um, I think, is a really important role. Mm. Any other questions? No. And then what we might do then is actually move right along. So. Please join me in thanking our three speakers.